Secretary General. I'm very happy to see you. Good day. Can you hear the translation? Is everything okay? Perfect, Mr. President. Esteemed Mr. Secretary General, I'm very happy to see you as uh, one of the countries uh, founding members of the United Nations and uh, permanent member of the UN Security Council. Russia has always uh, supported this universal organization, and we believe that uh, it is not just a universal organization, but a, a unique organization in its way. There is no other organization such as this in the international community, and we support in all ways uh, the principles uh, it, uh, it's based on and will continue to do that. Uh, to us, uh, it sounds very strange, uh, the statements of some of our colleagues uh, when they talk about uh, the rule-based world. We believe that the main rules uh, are the UN uh, Charter and other documents adopted by this organization and not some papers uh, written by somebody to uh, reflect their interests. We were also surprised uh, uh, when we heard uh, some of our colleagues' statements that uh, some uh, in the world uh, uh, claim uh, some exclusive rights because the UN uh, Charter uh, says that uh, all the participants in the international communications are equal irrespective of their might and size and their geographical situation. I think that uh, this is the same as uh, what uh, uh, is written in our Bible. All people are equal. Uh, this is, uh, we will probably find the same in the Quran and Torah. All people are equal under God. That's why it sounds very strange, uh, those ideas that some uh, pretend uh, uh, claim some exclusivity. We are living in a difficult world, in a complicated world. Uh, that's why we see uh, we have what we have. We are working with everybody. And, uh, of course, the United Nations uh, was uh, created uh, at the time uh, following a crisis. It's gone through different periods in its development. And just several years ago, we heard that it's outdated, uh, that it's not necessary. It was. Uh, it happened at the time when it was in somebody's way. Uh, it stood in the way of some countries who wanted to achieve some place on the world arena. So we've heard there, there are no other organizations like the UN, and we have to value it because it was created after the Second World War to solve uh, uh, such conflicts. So we know that you are concerned uh, on the subject of uh, Russia conducting a military operation operation in Donbass and Ukraine. I think that this will be at the basis of our conversation today. In this connection, I wanted to note that that uh, the whole problem uh, uh, emerged uh, after the, uh, the coup uh, in uh, 2014. This is an obvious fact. You can call it anything you want, and you can uh, call any preferences or opinions about people who were involved, but that was an anti-constitutional putsch. And after that, uh, the situation emerged with the will uh, of the residents of Crimea and Sevastopol, who acted uh, effectively in the same way as uh, people who lived uh, and, and who live in Kosovo did. They decided to become independent, and then they uh, approached us and uh, asked us uh, to join the Russian Federation. The only difference was that in Kosovo, such a decision on sovereignty was uh, adopted by the parliament. But in Crimea and Sevastopol, it was uh, taken on a national referendum. The same problem uh, was at the, in the east of Ukraine, where the residents of two territories, at least two territories, uh, the constituent parts of Ukraine, uh, didn't agree with the results of the the coup d'etat, but they found themselves under pressure, including uh, through the use uh, of uh, military force, including uh, uh, warplanes and heavy military equipment. This is how the crisis in uh, Donbass began in the southeast of Ukraine, as we know. 
After another attempt by the Kiev authorities to solve this problem through military means, we signed agreements in Minsk. They were called the Minsk Agreements. That was an attempt to settle the situation through peaceful means in Donbass. Unfortunately for us, in the course of eight years, the people who lived there were blockaded. The Kiev authorities publicly announced that they would organize a blockade of those territory. They were not embarrassed to say that it was a blockade, even though initially they uh, rejected that they were doing that, and they continued military pressure. In those conditions, uh, after the Kiev authorities effectively, publicly, and I want to stress this, publicly, through the, their uh, first uh, officials, uh, that they didn't uh, intend to comply with those Minsk uh, agreements uh, to prevent the genocide of those people. We had to declare those uh, states as independent. It was uh, forced. We had to do that to stop the suffering of people who lived in those territories. But our colleagues in the West preferred to ignore this. And after we uh, recognized their independence, they turned to us with the request to provide military assistance to them, because uh, they were subjected to military aggression and um, under Article 50. 1.7 of the United Nations Charter, we had to do this, and we launched a special military operation. I would like to inform you that despite uh, the fact that uh, there is a military operation underway, we still expect and hope that we will be able to achieve agreements uh, through uh, uh, a diplomatic uh, channel. We are conducting uh, negotiations with, and uh, in Istanbul, at the talks in Istanbul, and you've just been there. I've, I spoke to Erdogan, President Erdogan today that uh, you managed to um, achieve a, a serious breakthrough because uh, the requirements of uh, international security of Ukraine, our Ukrainian colleagues uh, didn't uh, link them uh, with such uh, concepts as internationally recognized borders of Ukraine. Uh, they brought uh, Crimea, Sevastopol, and um, the newly recognized uh, republics of Donbass, they made certain provisos there. But unfortunately, after the achievement of those agreements and, uh, and uh, after our clearly demonstrated uh, intentions uh, by us to create uh, favorable conditions uh, to continue the talks, we came across, uh, uh, we faced a provocation in Bucha, uh, to which uh, uh, the Russian army has uh, nothing to do. We know who staged that provocation, how they did it, and what people were involved in that provocation. And the position of our uh, negotiators uh, uh, for further settlement, uh, our negotiators' position changed uh, radically after that. They uh, uh, decided not to uh, move the issues of security guarantees uh, uh, and uh, the Crimea and Sevastopol and uh, Donbass uh, issues uh, outside uh, the agreement. They just uh, rejected that. And in their draft agreement, uh, we pointed that in two articles that these issues should be solved at the at the meeting of uh, the heads of state. Of course, we understand that uh, these issues, if we move them uh, to the level of the heads of state without solving them uh, preliminarily uh, in a draft agreement, uh, we know that they will never be settled uh, like that, and uh, to sign under security guarantees at, in that case without solving uh, the issues of territorial guarantees uh, with respect to Crimea, Sevastopol, and the Donbas republics, we cannot do that. Nevertheless, the talks continue. Uh, they're being now held uh, in an online uh, format, and I hope that uh, this will lead us uh, to some positive result. This is what I wanted to say at the beginning. Uh, I'm sure we will have many issues uh, in connection with the situation. Maybe we will talk uh, about other issues. I'm very happy to see you. Welcome to Moscow. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for receiving me in the Kremlin. It is true. As the Secretary General, my main concern is the situation in Ukraine. I have a clear understanding that we need a multilateral world order based on the UN Charter and international law. Any rules which will be established must be established with the consensus of the international community and they should totally reflect the international law. I strongly believe in the international law in the UN Charter, and this is why we differ in our views on the situation which take place. I understand that the Russian Federation has uh, several uh, claims uh, and complaints uh, about the situation in Ukraine and also in connection with the European global security. I've held uh, many positions in my life. I remember that I had uh, the possibility to meet you when I worked, when I was the head of the in the, uh, the, the EU and worked uh, for uh, the government of uh, Portugal. We even met in the same room, maybe. I understand uh, your consent, but uh, in our view, this uh, consent uh, must be solved used on various uh, tools uh, suggested by the UN Charter. We strongly believe that the violation of the territorial integrity of any country fully contradicts the UN Charter. And we are deeply concerned in connection with what's happening now. And we believe that there was an invasion into the territory of Ukraine. Nevertheless, I arrived in Moscow with a pragmatic approach. We are deeply concerned about the humanitarian situation in Ukraine. The United Nations is not part of the political negotiations. We've never been invited or allowed to take part in the Minsk process or the Normandy format. Uh, the UN was never part of those formats. We are not part of the talks. And I had uh, the opportunity to express this to Predigan Erdogan. We support the dialogue between the two countries and we support uh, Turkey's uh, goodwill in promoting this approach. But our main task is uh, with regard to the humanitarian situation in Ukraine and we want to improve it. This is exactly why I held uh, a meeting today with Minister Sergei Lavrov and I presented two proposals. First, to implement our proposal, which we presented at the meeting of the uh, with the Ministry of Defense. Our team works uh, with the Ministry of Defense uh, to clarify the situation with regard to uh, uh, humanitarian corridors and humanitarian aid, and that cooperation was uh, fruitful. But to be honest, we come across uh, situations when uh, Ukraine uh, establishes one corridor and Russia establishes another corridor, and the situation is such that uh, those corridors uh, do not work. Therefore, we propose that uh, there should be a humanitarian contact group uh, represented by uh, the UN, uh, Russia, and Ukraine. Uh, will will discuss the situation so that these corridors will be truly effective, so that nobody will have an excuse to uh, sabotage those corridors. On the other part, we understand uh, the difficult situation in Mariupol. Again, as for this situation, I would like to say that the United Nations is prepared to fully mobilize its logistical capacities, its human resources, together 
with the, the MCK MCK and the, uh, with the, uh, the Red Cross, and uh, uh, Mr. Maurer is prepared to support this initiative. We have to work together with the armed forces of Ukraine and Russia so that so once and for all this problem will be solved. This will be an initial operation to evacuate civilians from the Azovstal steelworks. Russia is permanently excused that it doesn't conduct this evacuation. On the other hand, Russia has announced the establishment of corridors which are not being used. And we are together with the Red Cross, with the Ukraine and Russia, we are prepared to assess the situation. And within two or three days, this will allow us to uh, evacuate those who want to be evacuated. Of course, this is a voluntary process. On the other hand, as for Mariupol, many people uh, and, and a large uh, area of the city has been destroyed. Many people are still there and they are in a difficult situation. They want to leave the city. Some want to leave uh, for Russia. Others want to leave uh, for the territory controlled by the Ukrainian authorities. And together with the Red Cross, we will use all our resources uh, to work together with the authorities of Russia and Ukraine in order to create this opportunity to guarantee the evacuation of those people. This will be a longer process. We have to establish uh, more concrete uh, forms of cooperation, but we are really interested in this. We pursue only one aim, is to alleviate the situation of those people and to alleviate their suffering. As I already said, this is uh, the opportunity uh, to, uh, to unite uh, our agencies and the, and the Red Cross and to do this process uh, totally transparent uh, so that nobody will accuse uh, the other party that something is not taken in. Uh, sorry. I uh, am really well uh, uh, aware of all the documents of the International Court of the UN on the situation in Kosovo. I remember very well the decision of the International Court, which says that uh, when implementing the right to self-determination, uh, uh, this or that territory of any country does not have to ask uh, for permission to declare their sovereignty to the central authorities of that country. That was uh, written uh, in relation to Kosovo, and that was the decision of the International Court. And that decision was supported by everybody. I personally read all the comments from uh, the legal and uh, administrative and political bodies of the United States and the European countries. Everybody supported that. If this is so, then the republics of Donbass, the Donetsk People's Republics and the Lugansk People's Republic have the same rights without uh, applying to the central authorities in Kiev to declare their sovereignty, because the president exists. Is this so? Do you agree with this? First of all, Mr. President, the United Nations doesn't recognize Kosovo. But the court, the court recognized this. Let me finish. The court recognized it. If this, is, uh, if this president has been created, then the republics of Donbass could have done the same way. Having done this, and, and, and then on our part, we got the right to recognize them as independent states. Many states in the world have done that, uh, including our opponents uh, in relation to Kosovo. Many countries in the world have recognized Kosovo. This is a fact. Many states, many Western states have recognized it as an independent state. We've done the same with relation to the republics of Donbass. But 
But after we did that, they uh, applied to us with a request to provide military help to them against uh, the country which was conducting military operations against it, against them. Uh, we were entitled to do this uh, under Article uh, 51.7 of the UN Charter. We will discuss about this later. I want to. Um, comments on the second part of your statement about Mariupol. The situation is complicated there and, and tragic. But it's simple, really. I've uh, spoken to President Erdogan today. He said that uh, military operations were taking place there. No, the op military operations have ended there. There are no military operations in Mari Mariupol. They've stopped. Parts of the armed forces of Ukraine, which were deployed in other industrial areas, they have surrendered. They Almost 1,300 people surrendered. They were taken prisoners, but there were even more of the more. There are some wounded there. They are kept in normal conditions. Wounded persons are receiving qualified medical assistance by our doctors. If the Azovstal steel works are completely sealed, is completely uh, sealed off, I ordered uh, not to assault it. There are no military, direct military operations there. Yes, we hear from uh, uh, the Ukrainian authorities that there are civilians there. In that case, the servicemen of the Ukrainian army must release them, or they are acting as terrorists in many countries, as the ISIS in Syria. They are hiding behind the civilians. This, the easiest thing to do is to release them. You are talking about uh, uh, the Russian uh, humanitarian corridors that they are not working. No, they lied to you. They are uh, working with our assistance. Uh, more than 100,000 people left Mariupol, 130 or 140,000 people people left Mariupol, and they're free to go anywhere. Some people want to go to uh, Russia, some to Ukraine, uh, anywhere. We don't hold them back, and we provide uh, all possible support and assistance to them. Uh, civilians can also do the same if they're there at the Azovstal works. They can just leave. An example of civilized attitude uh, to those people is obvious. Everybody can see that. Just uh, talk to those people who left. Uh, what would be easier for the troops there or for the representatives of the Nationalist Battalion? Just leave, uh, just release those people. It's uh, a crime to, heal the, to hold the people as a human shield if they're there. We are in touch with them, with those who is uh, holed up there in uh, the basements of the Azovstal works. They also have good examples. Uh, their comrades in arms uh, have uh, left and uh, lay down their arms. More than a, hun uh, a thousand people, uh, 1,300 actually, and nothing has happened to them. If you want to see uh, uh, esteemed uh, Secretary General and the representatives of the Red Cross and the United Nations, how they're being kept and where and how uh, medical assistance is being provided to wounded. To the wounded, we can uh, uh, help you. This is the easiest uh, solution of this difficult uh, or seemingly difficult issue. Let's uh, discuss this.